Today we will be reading from John chapter 11, verse 23 to 25. Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Good morning, church. What is your greatest need? If you could talk to the Lord right now and you could say to him, Lord, this is what I really, really need your help with today, what would it be? For Mary and Martha, it was their brother Lazarus. I imagine in this little town of Bethany, the closest town just about to Jerusalem, it's a town where Jesus would go through on his way to Jerusalem. He'd always stop over there. It was his, uh, his Motel 6, as you were. And he loved this family. And so when they saw, when the two sisters saw that their brother was sick, they knew exactly what to do. In John 11, the first few verses, we read that they urgently sent a note to Jesus, asking him for, for his help. This is a man who, if he was there, their brother would not have died. Their brother would not even be the sick. But Jesus knew something about what their request was that they didn't know. That this would eventually lead to God getting glory. And so instead of Jesus leaving immediately to rush over to his friend Lazarus, he stayed a couple more days. If you think about it, and you think about that being you, on the brink of death, Maybe like King Charles, you've got a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. You desperately need help. Or maybe it's as simple as you've got a baby who's starting to teeth, or, or maybe in three days you're about to have a baby. I don't know what your need is, but if you'll identify it at the beginning of John 11, you'll get the most out of it. You'll be able to figure out how a risen faith can embrace victory. And some of you know exactly what that need is. And yes, the thing about a need, it might today be this, and then it might evolve to something else. And so Jesus eventually, after talking to His disciples and letting them know with no uncertainty that Lazarus is not sleeping, but he's actually dead, heads out towards Bethany. It's just about time for the Passover. There's a lot of rumors going on. It's very dangerous for Jesus to go to Bethany. Uh, Thomas and the rest of the disciples say, yes, let's go and die with him. And so they realize it's a perilous, a perilous trip. But as they come closer to Bethany, Martha, realizing Jesus is on his way, rushes out. Her first words to Jesus was an accusation. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But as it is, she would explain that he's been dead for four days. It's at that point that Jesus says to her just about six or seven words that can change anybody's life. I am the resurrection and the life. No matter what your need is, if you understand those words, your need can turn to belief. It can turn to something unbelievable. And so Jesus, she realizes at that point that Jesus is more than just a friend, that He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And with this new found uh, hope in her heart, she must be thinking, is it possible? This man who can cause the blind to see, can cause the lame to walk, is it possible that my brother can live? She, she's got that thought in her head, and, and so she goes on and she gets Mary. She says, Mary, Jesus is here. You need to come talk to him. And Mary says the same thing. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. It's in this, in this area of knowing the need and, and understanding the faith and the belief, and the belief starting to develop into something more, that you see the vulnerability of the heart of Jesus. Where have you laid him? And they take they take Jesus to where Lazarus has been buried, and the air atmosphere is hanging rife with death. And it's at that point that Jesus cries as He calls Lazarus to come out the tomb. 
I want us to look at the story, and I want us to parallel this true event with the resurrection of Christ. I want us to see just how that works. How does risen faith eventually embrace victory? And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn along with me to John chapter 11. I will take just some quotes out of each section because we won't be able to cover everything. But I want you to look at the word need over there. And I want you to understand that that's why I started this lesson. I need you to understand that your need can reveal understanding. And understanding can breed, vulnerable, can breed belief. And belief can open yourself up to vulnerability. And so we see first off here the word need. There is the necessity of your faith that has to come to terms with where do you turn to. Do you turn to a doctor? Do you turn to a counselor? Do you turn to a, a, a very popular preacher? Or do you turn to Jesus? So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That necessity of faith becomes an eager expectation of God's power in verses 21 to 22. Listen carefully to what Martha is saying here. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay, we got that one, but listen now. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. No matter how impossible your situation is, no matter how you think this, this prayer request could never be answered, if you will turn it to Jesus and then stop the internal voices going on in your head and let Jesus take over, maybe your faith will become something a little bit deeper. And then we see this, this, this uh, uh, a little bit of faith now become a little bit more than just a, a, a fledged, fledgling faith as the elevated trust in Jesus' words comes alive. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha just puts off rote memory what she knows. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. That's the common answer that you're given in a situation like this. But Jesus challenges her beyond her traditions, beyond what she learned from a youth up when he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And then you see this new, this new confident assurance in the resurrection become true when Jesus continues to say, Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And here's the question for all of us. Do you believe that? Do you believe this? Take that need. Talk to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Hear the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Stop all other voices of doubt. And answer this question. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that? If you believe that, what can you not ask? <laughs> what prayer request can you not give before God? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. You're not just my friend. Something happens. Something clicks in her brain. You are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I know you are. I go to congregations. I, I sit with churches every Sunday. I do everything you ask me to do. And it's all about rote memory and just a, as if I'm going through the motions. But something, something is clicking in my head. My need is so great that I'm broken, that I'm brought down to my knees. And I realize there's only one I can rely on. Could you imagine the need that the ladies had as they walked to the tomb. Could you imagine how scary that was? They left the house while it was dark. They had all these supplies that they were carrying with them. They didn't know how they were going to open the, the tomb. That, that, that huge rock, their slender hands could never in a million years move that, that rock, but they knew they had to go. They knew they had to be there. And so they had this need, and they had this need that was, didn't yet have understanding, didn't yet have belief, did not yet have vulnerability. But it did have a desire to get up and to go to where Jesus is. That's all it had. And that's all you might have right now. You might just know, I've got to go to Jesus. I, I don't know what else. I don't know what's the next step. But I do know that. And so as they come around the corner... 
this need turns over into understanding. You see, that grave, that tomb is open. Look if you care to. The tomb is empty. Look where they laid him. Look, the grave clothes are there. He's not there. Don't seek the living with the dead. (laughs) Don't keep going to places for your answers where you're never going to get an answer. Go to the living God. Go to Jesus, who's your friend, who's been walking with you every step of the way, and realize he's more than a friend. He's the Messiah. He is the resurrection and the life. You see, the resurrection means nothing if you don't know that Jesus can do that. Every single one of us, at some point, when we're on our deathbed, breathing out our last breath, we're going to need to know this. How are you going to know that He can resurrect you once you're dead? How are you going to know that? Because He's done it. He did it. He did it to Lazarus. And Lazarus was not the only person that He raised from the dead. He also raised Himself and He raised other people. So will He be able to raise you? That's what you have to know. That's where your confidence needs to be. And then we move from this understanding, this need that reveals understanding, to an understanding that can bring belief. And you can follow along, if you would, to verse 28, and you can see how Jesus is going to take this understanding. Do you believe that I'm the resurrection of the life, Martha? Do you believe that? You're going to see how Martha goes and gets her sister, and how, how they together are going to be challenged to do something that is impossible. And so, yeah, we find, that first of all, the knowledge of Jesus' presence in verse 28. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is, and is calling for you. And then you can see how this, this knowledge gets nurtured into faith in the presence of Jesus by seeing His, his power, but, but by seeing His heart as well, by seeing His vulnerability. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in the Spirit and greatly troubled, and yes, Jesus wept, but Just go back to those words. You've got a need. Your heart is breaking. Is Jesus with you? Is He with you right now? And if He is, what do you know about His heart? When He sees your heart broken, when He sees your tears, do you understand that He is greatly troubled in His spirit? You know, the triune Godhead, the Son of God, sees you right now, and can you understand that? Can your faith nurture, can you nurture this faith in the power of Jesus' heart? And then, verses 39 through 40, can you overcome the doubt? Jesus said, take away the stone. I mean, come on, guys, you've got to be kidding me. Let's let's go to the graveyards, and let's tell the guy who's in charge of the graveyard, there, listen, I want you to take this rock off the stone over here. Do you realize what's happening here? Do you realize what happened the, twelve, the three hours that Jesus was on that cross and it became black and the ground gave up? Hades and Shaul gave up from captivity all those faithful that had been held there for, for a long time. And as you go ahead and you read in Ephesians chapter 3 how Jesus led those captivities, captives home. Imagine that if you challenged, if you can, if you want to think about it. See, absent in the body is to be present with Christ. I don't know. I don't know how it works. I just know that's what's going to happen. And so when he says, take away the rock, whoever was there is not going to be there anymore. You might need a place to go to mourn, but that person isn't there. That person would be with Christ. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Let those words sink in just for a second. Do you know that? And then finally, look at the witness of the power. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him 
and let them go. I wonder why Jesus need to say, needed to say that. Lazarus, come forth! You hear all the stifling cries and these mourners over there and they, they're heartbroken and, and Jesus' voice rings out with command and all the stifling sniffles are, are just silenced. And Lazarus comes out. And if you and I were there, we wouldn't know what to do. We'd see Lazarus over there, we'd just be too shocked to move. How do you move from this understanding? Her name is Mary Magdalene. She couldn't sleep. She, could, she tries to close her eyes the night before she would go and tend to Jesus' body the next day. She tries to close her eyes and she hears the thuds of those nails piercing the body of Christ. She tries to overcome that, and then she, she sees and hears a, 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 a spear penetrating the side of, of her Lord and Master's side, her friend. She sees the wart and the blood coming down. And so with bloodshot eyes, puffy eyes, sniffling all the way, she wakes up before anyone else because she can't sleep. The other ladies who were, she was going to go with are still sleeping, and she, she goes ahead. She wants to see the body of Christ. She wants to tend one last time to prepare his body for burial. That's the one thing she doesn't want to be cheated out of. She looks, the tomb's open, the body's gone, and she knows something bad has happened. She runs to Peter and, and, and John, and she says, he's missing, his body's not there. Well, Peter starts off running, and John, uh, being younger, overtakes him, and Peter comes in, and, and you know the rest of the story, how they see he's not there, and they leave. But she's like one of those mourners at a grave who can't leave. She just can't walk away from this. So she stands there. She looks at the garden. It's beautiful, isn't it? Thank you, Cheryl. I think you've got those flowers. They're really pretty. But she doesn't see the prettiness of the flowers. She doesn't smell the fragrance of the flowers. She just sees gray. She does, however, see the, the shadow through her tears of the gardener, and she says, where have you laid him? Do you know where he is? Tell me. I'll just take his body away. I won't, to, I won't do anything. I won't get you in trouble. Just let me know. And then she hears something that she knows better than her own heartbeat. Mary, she looks up. Teacher, in a second, her tears are wiped away. Her grief-stricken heart is filled with joy. She's the first one to see Jesus alive. Can your heart go there with me? Can you come to a point where you're vulnerable? The need will reveal understanding. That's where you've got to begin. The understanding will breed belief. But that belief, that belief can allow vulnerability. If you'll let it, it'll work your heart. Look at this resurrection section here as this belief rises in her heart. You'll see first the revelation of Jesus' power. Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth and so on. You can see how it increases into witnessing. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and had seen what had happened, believed in him, and some of them went to the Pharisees and told them, you can see then God's sovereign plan as Caiaphas, the high priest, says, you know what? It's better that one man die than the whole nation dies. And he's talking more about his own position and power being removed from him. Not realizing he did not say this on his own accord, but being the high priest that year he prophesied. And then you can find the expectations of the, of the appearance of Christ, to which we are still waiting right now for him to come again. 
and you see that they're looking for Jesus all over the place. Where do you find yourself in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Who are you? I know I'm the logical one. I'm the one that's going to need to see the proof. I'm the one that's going to ask the questions. He's been told over and over again by the other ten disciples, they've seen the resurrection Jesus. And he says, unless I can see the holes in his hands, unless I can put my hand into his side, into the broken flesh, I will not believe. And then it's in this cowering environment where he's thinking to himself, why did Jesus do this? Why did he allow himself to be killed in this way? It's disgusting. It's shameful. He could have prevented this. I left everything to follow him. And now look where he is. Look what he's done to me. Look where he's left me. And so he's hiding for his life. His life is in danger, as are all the disciples. And they're in this locked room. And Jesus just walks through the wall. What happened to Thomas at that moment? I can imagine Jesus inviting him, Thomas, come, come, come look at this. Come, come and see this. Imagine uh, maybe drawing, drawing Thomas's hand to, to touch and to stick his hand in there to see, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spirit. I am Jesus, I'm the Messiah, I'm, I'm your Lord. I'm the one that you loved, I'm the one who was discipling you, the one that you were following for the last three years. And it clicks in his head. And he falls to the ground. My Lord and my God. Great, great Thomas. You've seen me. Therefore you believe. But I want to talk to the summer church of Christ. I want to talk to every believer from this point on. Blessed are you who have not seen, yet believe. Can you allow Jesus to penetrate this cold heart? Can you take that knee to Jesus, whatever it is, and let Him take care of it? Maybe today you realize that if Jesus had to come right now, you wouldn't be right with Him. I remember many years ago, I had a whole lot of very, very, very bad things about to happen to me. My girlfriend was about to take off maybe forever. I was about to enter into war, and I had not been baptized. And the stubborn, cold heart of mine realized, I've got to make it right with God. If you're there today, you can do what I did. We've had about 10 people this, so far this year have done the same thing. I put Jesus on in baptism by dying to myself, to my own needs, to the sinful person that seems to want to take over my life all the time. I died in baptism with Christ. I was buried with Him in His tomb. I went into a watery grave in baptism, and I resurrected to walk a new life. Maybe your need is something different. Maybe you, you really need this church to pray for you right now. Or maybe that need is just between you and God. Whatever you need to do, I want to encourage you to seek the answer not in the world, but the cross of Christ by coming forward right now as together we stand and sing.